Hello fellow students, I'm very sorry if my voice is a little bit hoarse today because I am still recovering from a virus. Uh, I don't know if YouTube allows me to say the name of the virus but you probably can tell which one I'm talking about but enough about that. Last time I covered two of the three writing systems of the Japanese language, hiragana and katakana and I told you how important it was for you to memorize their characters. Now it's time for us to talk about kanji, the third and last writing system. I want to start this video by explaining I will be covering the basics of kanji, but I will not be encouraging you to study them this early in your learning journey. I don't mean to imply that kanji is something scary that should be avoided at all costs, but there are more important things that you should focus on, particularly grammar and vocabulary. In fact, I started studying Japanese about a year ago and I never actually actively engaged with kanji. All those that I already know, like the kanji for watashi for example, which means I, inhabit my brain because I've seen them in sentences over and over again. There is a lot of content containing kanji that can be consumed by those who only know how to read hiragana and katakana. And I'm not just talking about manga for children. Even some manga whose audience is more mature, for example Chainsaw Man, translate all their kanji into hiragana in a process which is called furigana. This is not the case, for example, in Berserk. Where only the less common kanji are accompanied by furigana. So as you see, manga is a great starting point when it comes to reading Japanese because you can find manga at all kinds of levels of difficulty. Japanese kanji come from the Chinese characters Anzi, also known as An characters, which refers to the An dynasty. But don't let the name fool you into believing that before the An dynasty there was no writing system in China because the history of the Chinese writing system began many dynasties before the Han one. Indeed, Chinese characters engraved on turtle shells dating back to the Chang dynasty have been discovered and these bone carvings made by oracles are considered to be one of the earliest forms of Chinese writing which, if we only consider writings that still exist today, is the oldest writing in the world. So kanji, which is how the Japanese say anzi, are the characters that were taken from Chinese writing and integrated into Japanese writing. Or rather, it would be more accurate to say that they form the Japanese writing since at that time Japanese was only spoken. Kanji was later joined by hiragana and katakana, as I explained in the video that will show up somewhere, so I won't be repeating myself. Chinese characters first arrived in Japan on stamps, letters, swords, coins, mirrors and other decorative objects imported from China. The earliest known example of such an import was the King of Na gold seal, given by Emperor Guangu, I hope I'm saying this name right, but yeah, given by Emperor Gangwa of An to a Wa emissary. Japan was recognized by Wa at that time. At first, Japanese didn't understand Chinese writing, or their understanding was very limited, something that only began to change towards the end of the 5th century. According to the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki, which are the oldest Japanese books, a scholar by the name of Wani arrived in Japan via the Korean kingdom of Bakje during the reign of Emperor Ojin at the beginning of the 5th century, bringing with him knowledge of Confucianism and Chinese characters. In ancient times, paper was so rare that people wrote kanji on thin rectangular strips of wood, which were called moka. The oldest writing kanji in Japan discovered so far was painted on a strip of wood dating from the 7th century, a record of commercial transactions involving cloth and salt. After the Meiji Restoration and as Japan entered an era of exchange with foreign countries, demands began to be made for the reform of writing system in Japan. Some academics 
called for the abolition of kanji and suggested that Japanese should be written only with kana, or alternatively with Latin characters. However, these were only the opinions of a minority. Nevertheless, the need to limit the number of kanji characters remained. In May 1923, the Japanese government announced that 1,962 kanji characters had been chosen for regular use. In 1942, this number was increased to 2,528 characters, when the National Language Council made available the standard kanji table. Finally, in 1946, after the Second World War, the Japanese government, guided by the supreme commander of the Allied Powers, instituted a series of orthographic reforms that made Japanese writing what it is today. These reforms included the incorporation of Jinjitai, simplified forms of some kanji. Formal lists of characters to be learned in each school year were also established, which means that Japanese children learn kanji over the course of nine years, from ages 6 to 15. Of course, despite the existence of this official list of 2528 kanji, there are characters outside of it that are still widely known and commonly used. But since kanji derived from anzi, the Chinese characters, you might ask why are these two set of characters so different? Well, there are four reasons for that. First, the Japanese created their own kanji, which are called wazei kanji. Wajik kanji are part of a category of kanji known as kokuji, which are national characters. Kokuji are Chinese characters that were created outside of China. This includes, of course, those developed in Japan, but also those that were made in other countries, such as Korea or Vietnam. In addition to kokuji, there are kanji that have been given meanings in Japanese that are different from their original meanings in Chinese. These are called kokun. Don't confuse Kokun with Kokuji. The four mentioned reforms carried out after the Meiji Restoration and the Second World War significantly altered the Japanese language. And the fourth reason is because China itself also reformed the Anzi, and the simplifications that were made to the characters have differed from those in Japan. Therefore, a Japanese native cannot be expected to be able to translate Chinese characters. I thought there is some innate understanding given the proximity of the two scripts. Speaking of this proximity between the Japanese and the Chinese characters, I have a personal funny story to tell. Shortly after I started learning Japanese, I passed by a Chinese restaurant in a casino and some kanji popped out, for example the kanji for meat, which is the same in both languages. This doesn't mean that you know Chinese just because you know Japanese, but it's funny that some kanji are the same and that you will be able to recognize some Chinese characters just by learning Japanese. We already understand that to achieve some fluency we will eventually need to learn around 2000 kanji. But how many are there for real? Although it's a question that makes me curious, it's not easy to come up with an answer since there is no definitive count of kanji characters just as there is no definitive count of Chinese characters in general. In other words, we don't know. The Dai Kan Waji Ten, which is a Japanese kanji dictionary, which is notable for being really big, compiles around 50,000 characters. And the Zongwe Zi, published in China, contains around 85,000 characters. A small part of me would like to memorize all of them. <laughs> it's just one of those thoughts that go through your head when it's midnight and you are in bed and able to fall asleep it's just one of those thoughts don't worry i will not try to memorize 50,000 characters now that we've talked about the origins of kanji it's time to look at the characteristics of the kanji themselves to begin with kanji can also be called mana 
which means true name, a reference to the fact that these characters are symbols that allude to a meaning or concept. In opposition to this, there are the kana, hiragana and katakana. And kana means borrowed name, since they are used to symbolize sounds. There are various ways of categorizing kanji. One of them takes into account the role of the kanji in question in Japanese society. Kyoiku kanji, or education kanji. These are the first 1026 kanji characters that Japanese children learn in elementary school, from 1st to 6th grades. They code for simple concepts and words, but their writing, in terms of strokes, can be quite complex to the non-native speakers. There are simple words that translate into elaborate kanji and complex words that translate into simple kanji. Jōyō kanji, or kanji of regular use. There are 2136 characters consisting of all the yōiku kanji plus an additional 1110 kanji to be instructed to children after 6th grade. All the kanji outside this list are usually uh, accompanied by furigana. That's why these are considered necessary to become literate in Japanese. Kanji jimmeyo, or kanji for use in personal name. This is a list of kanji consisting of 863 characters. The kanji on this list are mainly used in people's names. Yogai kanji, or unlisted kanji. These are any kanji not contained in the joyo kanji and jimmeyo kanji lists. There is another classification that might make more sense for those trying to learn kanji. Choke moji, pictographic. What comes to people's minds when they hear the word kanji is this type of kanji. These kanji were formed by the simplification of drawings representing everyday objects and phenomena. Two famous examples are the kanji for fire, which looks like a pile of burning wood, with the flames represented by two strokes, or the kanji for river, whose strokes illustrate the flaw of the stream. Chijimoji, ideographic. These represent the abstract, feelings, ideas, numbers. Kai emoji, complex type 1. These are made up of radicals, or, or in other words, components. We will talk about radicals later, which together form a new idea. Let's look at some examples. Clarity is formed by combining the radicals sun and moon. Wood is made up of two radicals three. Forest is made up of three radicals three. KJ emoji, complex type two. In this kanji, while one radical provides the meaning, the other provides the pronunciation. The kanji for copper is a complex of this type, where this means metal, and this tells us that the word is pronounced do. This kanji alone has another meaning, but it doesn't matter in this context. Catch emoji. A category of kanji that have been adopted into Japanese because of their sound rather than their meaning. For example, this kanji. In ancient China, this was the kanji for wheat. However, the pronunciation of wheat in classical Chinese was very similar to that of the verb to go in Japanese. So it came to be used to symbolize the verb to go in Japan. Kanji are classified in kanji dictionaries according to their main components, which are called radicals, or roots. It is considered that a total of 214 radicals exist, derived from the 18th century Kangxi dictionary. There is a debate about whether kanji can have more than one radical, but as far as I can tell, each kanji has only one official radical. I thought it can be sometimes difficult to find because a kanji can have several components that could be classified as a radical. Out of these, there is a primary one. This is because the role of a radical is to organize dictionaries, so if there were more than one radical per kanji, it would mean that a kanji would have to appear twice in the dictionary. However, if it helps you in your studies, I think it's fine to consider the kanji as a group of combined radicals, whatever works for you. The radicals are categorized into seven main groups according to their position within a kanji. Note that some kanji are also radicals in their own right. Often the meaning of a kanji is related to the meaning of its radical, as you can see in these examples. So even though this isn't true for many cases, it only works when the radical is a symbolic radical, 
It might be good to keep it in mind, nevertheless, for memorization purposes. Now, if you want to know more about radicals, how to find a radical in a particular kanji, or what is the right order to do the strikes when writing kanji, you can visit my blog in the description below, and there I have the links to places where you can learn these things. So, this part is important, so I ask for your attention. Each kanji can be used to write one or more different words or morphemes, which results in different pronunciations or readings. The correct reading is determined by contextual clues. So, for example, this is mostly read as kyo, which means today. But in formal writing, it is read as konichi, which means nowadays. This is implied by the context. So, if you see this word in a formal document, it will probably be read as konichi. But if you see this word in a text between friends, it will most likely be read as kyo. Sometimes furigana is used to clarify ambiguous readings, but do not count on that because this is not always the case. Kanji readings are categorized as either onyomi, commonly referred to as on, which comes from classical Chinese pronunciation, or kuniomi, commonly referred as kan, which is the Japanese way of pronouncing the characters. Most kanji have at least two readings at least one of each. However, some characters only have a single reading, such as Kiku, Chrysanthemum, an on reading, or Iwashi, Sardine, a kan reading. It's natural that many Kokuji, which are kanji invented in Japan, only have kan readings. Some kanji have 10 or more possible readings. For example, this one, which is read as Sei, Cho, Nama, Ki, Ou, Ikiru, Ikazu, Ikeru, Umu, Umareru, Aeru, and Ayazu. Two of these readings are on, while the rest are kan. But do not freak out, when there is a kanji like this, there is most likely one or two readings which are the most common ones and are used like 90% of the time. So you don't need to decorate all the readings that a kanji has. But let's talk about Oniomi and Kuniomi in more detail. The Oniomi, or Sino-Japanese reading, is the modern descendant of the Japanese approach to the Chinese pronunciation of a character at the time it was introduced. In other words, when they came into contact with the kanji, the Japanese had an idea of how it was pronounced in Sino, and that idea became the on reading, or readings. Interestingly, there are Kokuji, which are kanji created by the Japanese, which have been giving an onyomi reading even though they are not a character derived from or origi originated in China. Why did they decide to give on readings to certain kokuji? It's a good question that I don't have the answer to. Okay, fine. The on readings derive from an approximation of how the Chinese pronounced a particular kanji. But then why there are so many different on readings? You can blame the dynasties for that. Kanji were introduced from different parts of China at different times, so they have several onyomi and often several meanings. Onyomi can be classified into four types according to their region and time of origin. The go on readings, wu sound, derive from the pronunciation used in the northern and southern Chinese dynasties during the 5th and 6th centuries. The canon readings, and sound come from the pronunciation used during China's Tang dynasty. The to on readings, Tang sound, are based on the pronunciations of later dynasties in China, such as the Song and Ming. They cover all the readings adopted from the Ayan era to the Edo period. And finally, Kanyo on readings are misinterpretations of kanji that have become accepted in the Japanese language because they are so common. The most popular form of reading is Ken on. The second one. As for the kuniomi, which translates as native reading, it's a reading based on the Japanese pronunciation of a word that closely matched the meaning of a Chinese character when it was introduced. In other words, when a new kanji was introduced, it was combined with the sound already associated with that concept. So when bird was introduced, the sound tori became one of the possible readings, 
because that's how the Japanese refer to birds orally. As with onyomi, there can be several kunyomi for the same kanji, and some kanji have no kunyomi. Concerning kanji with several kan readings, we have the example of the kanji for East, which had the on reading to at the time of its introduction. However, the Japanese already had two words for East, Igashi and Azuma, thus the kanji had the last readings added as kunyomi. Meanwhile, the kanji ki, the Chinese concept of ethereal life force, has no native Japanese equivalent, so it only has on readings. And finally, as we have already discussed, most kokuji only have kunyomi. Now, you might be wondering, can I tell if a reading is on or can just by looking at it? Not in principle, but there is a little trick. On readings are monosyllabic, which contrasts with can readings, which can have two, three or even four syllables. Be aware, however, that can readings can be monosyllabic as well. And now the question that is probably consuming you alive. But then, when I come across a kanji, how should I read it? The real answer to this question would be that's the wisdom that comes with practice. But since that answer is anything but satisfactory, let me elaborate. Although there are general rules for when to use onyomi and when to use kunyomi, the language is full of exceptions and it's not always possible to know how to read a character. This is true even for native speakers. Not to mention the fact that a given kanji can have several on and kan readings. But since we all have to start somewhere, I will give you some guidelines. When a solitary kanji is accompanied by okurigana, this is when a word is made up of kanji plus hiragana characters, you should use one of the kan readings of this kanji. When a word is made up of several kanji, which is called kango, the reading is usually on. When a kanji has several on readings, the most commonly used is can on. When a kanji appears alone in a sentence, with no other kanji or hiragana characters accompanying it, one of the kan readings is generally used, but out of the four, this is the rule with the most exceptions. Let's look at an example. The words east and north are read as igashi and kita, and these are kan readings. But the word northeast is not read as igashi kita, but as to oku, because the two kanji are read as on. And I don't want to overcomplicate things, but there's something else that you need to know. There are some cases where neither the on nor the kan reading are used to read the word made up of kanji. The Japanese word for adult is a combination of the kanji big and person. However, it doesn't read as daiji or oito, but otona. I don't know how these are officially called, so we will just call them irregular readings. So, as you can see, kanji can be quite complex. And in regards to that, I want to share a story before we part ways. You might not know this because I don't think I mentioned it, but I am a published writer. I had published a trilogy by the age of 14. And as you can tell, I started very young. I started writing when I was nine. I finished my first book when I was 10. And my father does martial arts. And so he knows a lot of, well, not a lot, but some Japanese people. He has Japanese acquaintances. And once my father introduced me to his Japanese acquaintances and told them that I was a writer. I found it strange at the time because they treated me with a lot of respect, even though I was a child. They would curtsy and call me sensei and all of that. And I didn't quite understand at the time, but now I do. Because being a writer in Japan is quite a respected job. And you can see why after this lesson. I'm not saying that being a writer or being an author is easy in any language, but Come on, when I had just finished it, writing my third book, third, Japanese kids were still learning kanji. But yeah, just wanted to share that. I do now understand, being a writer in Japan must be quite hard, more than in my country, more than in your country, probably. I know today's lesson was heavy, but I will remind you of what I said at the beginning of all of this. 
My intention is only to familiarize you with what kanji is, not to encourage you to actively study it. At least not just yet. The Japanese material that we'll be consuming soon doesn't require us to have any knowledge of kanji, because every kanji that appears has a furigana translation. For now, I want you to have an idea of how kanji arrived in Japan, to know that kanji can be divided into parts, that one of these parts is the main one, which is called the radical, and to be aware that each kanji can have several readings, some on and some kan. And when you study kanji seriously in the future, you can come back to this video and rewatch it so that you will have a starting point. So, until next time, and if you still haven't memorized hiragana and katakana, I suggest you get back to it. If you want to support me, please subscribe, give like, leave a comment, all of that. This one was a lot of work. I was so tired of reading about kanji that I accidentally called my cat kanji twice. My mom said that I was losing it. I will be very happy if you want to support me in any way. On next video I will talk a bit about mythology. I hope to see you there.